Hello, and welcome to Keep the Channel Open, a podcast featuring conversations about art, literature, and creativity. My name is Mike Sakasagawa, and this is episode 131. Today's guest is Fateme Begmoravi. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the show. This week, I'm talking with photographer Fateme Begmoradi. Fateme Begmoradi is an artist born and raised in Iran. In 2008, she earned her Bachelor of Fine Arts in Photography at the University of Tehran. In 2012, Begmoradi moved to the U.S. and in 2017 received her Master of Fine Arts degree in Photography at the University of New Mexico. The themes of loss and identity define much of the work that she has made. These themes emerge both directly and indirectly. Transitions in her life, both physical and emotional, have been critical in her work. Since 2005, she has participated in more than 40 shows in the United States, Iran, England, France, and China. I first became acquainted with Fateme's work during her Second Sight lecture at the 2021 Medium Festival of Photography. The Second Sight Award is given by the festival each year to one of the photographers who participated in the portfolio reviews. And the winner, who is selected by a vote of that year's reviewers, is then invited back the following year to give an artist lecture. I've put a link in the show notes to the recording of Fatima's lecture, which I highly recommend watching. I was immediately struck visually by her series, It's Hard to Kill, in which she takes copies of archival family photos from Iran and partially burns them. Burning prints is such a viscerally arresting technique, of course, but as she described in her lecture, the burning of these photographs is a way of both exploring the effects and after effects of the Iranian revolution and of connecting with her own family history. Needless to say, I was very interested to talk with Fateme after seeing her lecture, and I'm glad to have had the opportunity. Before we get started, one quick update about the show. Starting with this episode, Keep the Channel Open will be switching to a monthly release schedule. It's my hope that I'll be able to get back to bi-weekly episodes next year, but for the time being, this is what will work to help make the show more sustainable. All right, let's get started. Here's my conversation with Fateme Begmorati. So I've been thinking a lot about... Your work, I, I went back and rewatched your Medium presentation earlier this mm-hmm. week. Uh-huh. And, you know, there are a lot of things that sort of came up for me when I was thinking about your work. And I think probably the biggest sort of all-encompassing topic has to do with the relationship between memory and photography. This is yeah. clearly something that's important to you and to your work. Mm-hmm. It's something that's also important to me and my work as well. Mm-hmm. And it it seems to me that the relationship between memory and photography is something that is sort of an inherently fraught thing. And there are so many different ways that we can think about that relationship. But I wanted to start there and sort of, I guess, start by asking you with with what for you that relationship looks like. The relationship between photography and memory is a definitely complicated (laughs) relationship. Sometimes I trust it, sometimes I don't, you know. For example, in the, the body of work that is hard to kill, the kind of relationship that I have with the memories is actually totally trust. I actually make work, make some fake reality based on the memories or thoughts that I hear. But again, in the other body of work, objectivity and subjectivity, what I did, I questioned how mem- memory serve us, how, how we can trust it. In a brief way, I can say that. It's interesting because, you know, one of the things about these is that the, these two bodies of work that you mentioned in objectivity, mm-hmm. subjectivity, you are working with images that come from your family home. And so these are sort of more explicitly memories that come from your own personal history. Whereas with It's Hard to Kill, you're working with archive images, found images that are not from your own life. And yet it's something very interesting to me that you'd say that the memory feels more trustworthy to you when in some way it's like you're working with someone else's memories. Does that make sense? That's interesting. I, I, I haven't think about that like that, but you are right. It's, uh, it sounds yeah, maybe then it's more connected to uh, to uh, memories of a group of people, 
you know, not just me as an individual. For mm. example, in that um, project, It's Hard to Kill, I try to connect with, uh, you know, my father's experience, my father experience, then through that with the, you know, what a nation experienced during that time or different nations in different time experience. Yeah, it's somehow more trustable for me when it's about other peoples are involved. So for myself, I grew up in the United States, as did, um, you know, several generations of my family now. So mm -hmm. I have a tendency to think of things in a pretty American way. And I yeah. think that something that's very sort of well known about America and Americans is how highly individualistic the society yeah. here is. Um, and yet my own sort of ancestral culture coming from Japan is one mm -hmm. that is much less so. It's something that I always find very interesting, this relationship that we have between the individual and the collective. Even in America, it's not something that can be fully one way or the other, but sort of along this sort of spectrum of being between the individual and the group. The idea that something might feel more trustworthy, a memory being something that is built, that's constructed, yeah. Yeah. something that we're constructing together being more... Um, feeling more secure or maybe more concrete is sort of fascinating to me. And I, I guess I wonder if that sort of sparks anything for you. That's interesting. You know, as an artist, you and me, whenever we are working, probably we do not analyze how we think. But um, now when we are talking, I can see how partially I consider some stuff in my unconscious, you know, is come from the, you know, the culture and the background that we grew up in. And yeah. I think too, you know, something that is very interesting to me about this work is the relationship between the sort of fact of immigration. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that struck me the most from your presentation was this notion that your parents don't take a lot of photographs and don't necessarily, you know, your family not necessarily valuing the old photographs. But clearly, for you, this is something that is more, um, or at least was more um, acute, that there is something yeah. about this. And having talked to a number of different artists from different diasporic communities, mm -hmm. what I found is that a lot of people who are either immigrants themselves or who come from immigrant families seem to have this real longing for history, whereas the people's parents, who yeah. are often the ones who were the immigrants themselves, at least in the mm -hmm. people that I've talked to, tend mm -hmm. not to have that same. And they tend to be more forward-facing, more concerned yeah. with the future than the past. Yeah. What I find really interesting about your project here is that there's a little bit of both of these things happening in that Unlike a lot of people like myself, for example, mm -hmm. who, you know, my own family has been in the United States for five generations or six, yes. if you count my children, yeah. whereas you yourself, you, you know, you were raised in Iran and mm -hmm. you, you're, you are the immigrant generation yourself. Mm -hmm. But I, there's something, I don't know, this, this longing for connection with the past is something that does seem so tied to that moment of immigration and immigration as a separation, if that makes sense. So I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I really like that you put uh, immigration and separation next to each other. Maybe what um, helped me to, to make this kind of body of work here right now is exactly the same as what I experienced as a child when I see an empty album with a trace of photos but it, no photos in that album. I see that album at home and how valuable it was for my mom, <laughs> but there was no photos. Mm. And um, yeah, definitely there is a connection here. Uh, it seems that immigration is a, is a bigger separa separation, but mm. this, still the same. About uh, uh, the other part that we talk about, that about um, memories and photography, all these things, my father was really a photo person. And mm. uh, even, you know, my father uh, passed away last year. But um, since the uh, last time I saw, saw him, um, probably five or six years ago, still, when I wanted to make him happy, I find one of the 
old photo of him when he was young and printed for him mm. and makes him really happy. It make it more questionable for me that why we do not have a family photos that much. I think that separation it can be caused with many things. For example, um, what we experienced, uh, you know, after Islamic Revolution in Iran. I remember that uh, when I was a kid, I could see clothes in our wardrobe that okay, but I wore them when I was young. You know, right now they are not proper. You know. If, the life side, everything changed. So it, it can be translated to kind of separation. I, I, at least I look at it like that. I guess like, you know, when I'm thinking about separation, so many of the different artists that I've talked to, for example, when I, t- I talked quite a while ago at this point with the, the writer Esme Wei Jun Wang, mm-hmm. who, you know, her debut novel had to do with sort of a multi-generational trauma that is passed down through an immigration, but she was interested in thinking about immigration as traumatic. And another Mm -hmm. thing that I was thinking of was when I had talked with um, this artist, uh, Rizelle Javier, who is local here in San Diego. She actually lives really close to me. Mm -hmm. Her, one of the things we talked about in our conversation was for her, um, so she's Filipina and it's her parents that were, that immigrated from the Philippines to Mm -hmm. the United States. Mm-hmm. And the thing that I, one of the things that came up in, in our conversation was how she had always been so interested in the family history. And it's something yeah. that her parents hadn't really passed on to her mm-hmm. and that she had had this conversation where her, her dad said something like, why do you want to know so much about this? It's not, it's not yours. Exactly. Oh my God. I hear it from my father too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that, that, that really sort of shook me when, when she <laughs> said that. And so for her, it's this connection to the Philippines where she has visited, but hasn't, you know, didn't grow up there for you. Yeah. You did grow up in Iran. So it's not to yeah. say that the culture of, uh, you know, Iranian culture is your culture, yeah. but still it's fascinating to hear you say, because the, to maybe the separation there is more to do with having um, lived through the revolution at that time. Does that sort of feel right to you? Uh, You know, um, I think one of the things that um, bring me to this point to, you know, think that way or make make this kind of work, you know, I I grew up in a society that we had to live a double life, home and at school in public. Mm. I should be careful, you know, whatever I, you know, I said about my parents at school, you know, I remember I was in the first grade and uh, <laughs> they come to our class that say, who wants to sing in the class, in, in the, you know, in the class next, next morning. I said, I want to sing. And I was at home that night. I was trying to prepare myself by singing a song, which was a love song. <laughs> and it was not for kids, actually, but it was kind of um, um, pop uh, Persian music. But it, in that time, that kind of music was banned by government there. And when my sister figured out that I'm, I'm trying to sing that song <laughs> in my class, they said, no, you shouldn't do that. And the next day, I was so afraid even going to school. Mm. You know, for even the separation happened in the first stage, home and out of home. Mm. For me, it was like that. And I, I, was, I wanted to, to see how... How is possible to not not uh, you know have this kind of separation? Mm. And uh, I was always in search to to know more, to see more, you know, uh, from the more balanced society. Mm. The the one of the things that you talk about in your presentation mm-hmm. had to do with you know, people burning their, their photos as a way of protecting themselves or possibly protecting the other people in the images. Yes. Yes. And I guess I wonder if there is something about that. And, you know, when you say your dad also says to you or said to you, you know, why do you want to know about this? It's not yours. Mm -hmm. If there is also perhaps, you know, and then this, this story that you've just told about your sister also seems very similar that this desire to protect the people around you. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, totally. 
supposedly. But it is an interesting question to me of this, of what is and isn't ours. So this is not a person I've talked with myself on the show, mm -hmm. but there's a writer named Brandon Shimoda, who mm -hmm. is um, a Japanese American. Mm -hmm. And he writes about the Japanese American incarceration during World War II. Uh -huh. He's working on a project right now that um, I talked to him just one-on-one -on -one about where what he's interested in is the ways that for people that did not live through the incarceration themselves. So like, for mm -hmm. example, for me, it's my grandparents who lived through that time and not myself. Yeah. And yet I still feel this very strong connection to that story. And in some ways, when I read other people's writing about it, even though this happened many decades before I was born, I feel yeah. it almost feels like I, it happened to me, you know? And so, I know. And so yeah. this question of like, what does and doesn't belong to us? What is and isn't passed on? And what does that mean? It's so interesting to me. Can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, of course. I, I think somehow all of it belong to us and somehow all of it not belong to us. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a really vague um, line uh, for me. But for me, that's like that. Uh, I, whenever I want to make work and talk about it, I consider it all belong to me, you know? <laughs> and I, I don't know, it's in our DNA how we, I don't know, I don't know. You know, even um, I, I was born after Islamic Revolution, but definitely I'm still, still uh, living the consequences of that specific day that the, the revolution happened. Mm. You said about... Um, you know, Japanese and American uh, writer, uh, I was thinking about um, Patrick Nagatani work. Oh, yeah. He probably, yeah, his body of work about that camps are very also pretty interesting and uh, meaningful to me. For me too. <laughs> yeah. 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 And for me, you know, and, uh, seeing that work yeah. is the way that Patrick Nagatani sort of talks about the violence that that you know, the, that the government did to this community that he and I are both a part of. Yeah. It is something that's very, it's very hard for me to separate myself from, you know? Mm -hmm. how, but, how can be? In, it's, I think it's not possible. Yeah. But it does seem like, and I don't know if this is something that comes up for you in your work, but there's always for me the question of how much of this is appropriate for me to even not necessarily claim, but certainly that would be something that I'd question the appropriateness of. But because I didn't live through that experience myself, and neither did my parents mm -hmm. for that matter, it is in many ways a, a very foreign experience to what I've actually lived. And yet mm -hmm. it still feels very present to me. And yeah. there's some something where I sometimes question whether that's even an appropriate thing for me to feel, you know what I mean? And it seems like with your mm -hmm. work here, because you're dealing with archive photos for the It's Hard to Kill project, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's definitely, I can see an aspect where you are, it must be important to you to make a connection with these images and with the yeah. experiences. Yeah. And yet also there is a little bit of a separation there because as you know, we've said that that's something yeah. that you didn't live through yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, yes. And uh, you know what I think? I think uh, as long as a subject, for example, that uh, camps or whatever happened during the revolutions in different parts of the uh, the world and even for different kind of uh, different nations, as long as I feel a connection and I feel I need to say something about that, I have all right to talk about that. Hmm. It's how I feel it. Is that something that you've ever gotten any pushback about? Yeah, what do you mean pushback? Like where people, well, for example, like you, you mentioned that your, your father once, you know, had said like, why, you know, this isn't, it's not yours. Right. But yeah. And I wonder if that's something that ever happens with, um, you know, viewers or with other people that you've maybe families you've tried to work with before, or whether it's been more of a more purely acceptance on that side. No, um, I, I'm happy that you asked this question. Um, 
about the you know um, for this series uh, i collect photos from other families mm -hmm. and uh, it takes time to get their trust and even they want to talk about that and some of them even gave their photos to me to work with and they said just in a condition that you you for example do not show them in iran mm -hmm. you know people have some resistance sometimes um Sometimes even when I talk to people, they, they try to, you know, make me to understand that how I cannot understand the situation because I didn't experience that. Mm. It is, it is, you know, it is like that. I experienced that, but still I reserve the right for myself <laughs> to talk about it and make work about it. Yeah. <laughs> It seems like a very complicated question, mm -hmm. you know, and one that negotiating that relationship between the self and the other and the image is um, kind of necessarily complicated. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, you sh uh, showed in your presentation some previous work that it doesn't appear on your website, images where you are, for example, sewing onto some of the images yeah. Or images where you are, like you've, you've put yourself into the picture, into mm -hmm. someone else's family photos. Yes. To me, there's something very interesting about the idea of, of interacting with the image, mm -hmm. whether mm -hmm. it's by interacting with the subject of the image by manipulating yeah. that, or whether it's by manipulating the physical print by stitching mm -hmm. it or burning mm -hmm. it, or any any of the other ways that, you know, if you've made things more sculptural. Yes. So what is, what for you is that experience of interacting with the image that way? Like, what what do you, what do you get out of that as the artist? So uh, the words that you mentioned that, um, you know, inserting my, my, my own image in the photos and also sewing on them, it was a time that I was in a transition, you know, before I came to the U.S. in um, almost 10, year, 10 years ago, my photography practice was I was actually taking photos. But mostly I take photos in a familiar places that I had a, had a history for me. Mm. For example, I make series in uh, my parents' house or, you know, I make series with, the, you know, wallpapers in my parents' house or something like that. The, the history behind the, the place was important for me to you know, bring something out of that photos. But when I came to the U.S., for almost two years, I couldn't touch my camera. I didn't trust whatever I captured, you know? Uh, I, I thought, okay, I'm a tourist here, or I, I, I still couldn't find myself here, couldn't find my voice here. So I stopped taking photos. Then I get so, you know, I reach out to the old family photos that I uh, had. I start working with them, and uh, you know, I was so, you know, homesick in that period of time. I couldn't back to Iran. So I just try to leave the moments that I threw the, in the photos by inserting myself to them, that I couldn't leave them, you know? Mm. Uh, also, it was, you know, kind of a um, hard time for me. You know, I, I married and after some months I divorced. Probably that sewing on the photos, I was trying to put every, everything together. You know, it's, sometimes I feel it comes from that, that point. That by sewing, you know, even there are some words that I didn't uh, show them even in the presentation. I s actually saw photos and saw photos to each other. I just trying to keep everything together. But all of this, um, you know, opened the path for me to finally figuring out what I want to get from this project. So they were all uh, baby steps for the. It's for this one. It's hard to kill. Mm. Then I went to Iran, and for the first time, I, you know, when my parents see how I'm interested about old family photos, they revealed to me that they actually uh, burned photographs, and it become again the new start for me. Mm. It's interesting because you know one of the things that you've talked about in relation to this, I think this is in your artist statement too, is about. Mm -hmm 
how the act of the burning of the photos is that you you've talked about it as a as a violent act an aggressive act you've talked about it as um you know in relation to censorship uh-huh. and i think that this is a compelling aspect uh, of the project is to think about it in terms of violence and censorship mm-hmm. especially in the context of you know a political and social revolution that did involve violence yes but also you know hearing you talk about sewing the prints in in some of the previous work because mm-hmm. stitching is something that you could also see that as a violent act right because you're literally puncturing the print right you're making a hole yeah. in it and yeah. yet just as the same sort of what you were saying is trying to um, mend it or if you mm-hmm. think about it in terms of surgery we use stitches to heal mm-hmm. and in the same way we use fire or you know in some cultures we use fire as part of a funeral experience to Mm -hmm. you know burn a body and funeral experiences are all about yeah i mean it is about a connection with the the deceased and their and their wishes and you know sending them on but it's also about the way that we who remain are able to heal and move forward Mm -hmm. and so i guess i'm interested to, to see like how those interact for you because you know there is the the more violent aspect to it but there's also the more healing aspect to it and so i wonder how you think about those yourself Hmm. Uh, you know i I was thinking about um there is something else violent healing and also cleansing Mm. you know um in persian culture actually there is a um I, I don't know if you are familiar with Zoroastrian or not. A little um, bit. Yeah, so for, for in that religion, fire is so important. It's something that cleans you, you know. So the fire in this series kind of means all the three of them at the same time. You know, mm. it depends how how you look, how much you know about the p- people in that photos, you know. Definitely all three of them. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really what gives it the um, sort of emotional weight as a viewer is to be able mm-hmm. to hold all three of those in your mind at the same time because they don't feel like the same thing. In some ways, they feel almost opposite to each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. got that. So then, you know, I'm thinking too about censorship. Mm-hmm. And this is something that you've talked about with some of the, uh, both with It's uh, Hard to Kill and then a little bit more in in an ongoing project that you mentioned Mm -hmm. that had to do with getting rid of photos or books by burning them or tearing them or burying them. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. when you, you you had a feature in um, uh, Ignant magazine that was, Mm -hmm. um, there's a quote from you here that says, I'm making my work based on a true story that happened over and over for different people from different nations after social revolutions What I'm thinking about here is that I feel like it's very easy and obvious to look at this project, whether it's the newer project that you're working on or whether it's um, it's hard to kill as being specifically in an Iranian context. And yet Mm -hmm. there are so many parallels. And in fact, I can't help thinking about, you know, this is something that's come up uh, a lot more recently than your presentation, Mm -hmm. but how even now in the United States, we're talking about things like banning books and people are, are literally burning books as well here. Wow. And I, I guess, I guess I'm just sort of, I'm wondering like, you know, (laughs) what happened? You're going backwards. Well, (laughs) you know, so you're, you're a person who came to this country from somewhere else. Right. And Mm -hmm. I always find that, you know, the act of immigration people that I know, whether it's in my family or extended family, or just people that I know who, who Mm -hmm. immigrated to the United States tend to have sort of a different perspective on what this country is than people who grew up here. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. And so I guess I'm, I'm just like, I feel like right now the United States is going through something that, that maybe either it already is, or it's the sort of precursor to something that might later be called a social revolution. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so this project feels very relevant to me, not in just an Iranian context, but in an American yeah. context. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if that's something that has occurred to you. And if so, you know, what you think about all that? Um, you know, as I said before, when, when I was making works, so 
I, I didn't think about any of them. I just, um, in the moment that I'm making work, I do not think about who will be my audience, how it affects on others. Honestly, it's so personal. Mm -hmm. After it's finished, it will be, you know, uh, public, then it might dialogue come to it or not. But, um, um, you know, when I start working, I, I started with my father's story, but definitely when I, you know, receive emails and also in the exhibition people talk with me the similar experience in germany in uh, argentine in cuba it it was so goosebumping for me and mm. uh i become so <laughs> actually uh it was so so i was so happy to could make the connection with people mm. yeah but i i never compare it with the uh, you know situation in U u.s that's interesting um, <laughs> for me, honestly. <laughs> I wonder if that's something that audiences might bring to you more now that things, I mean, things are definitely changing a lot here. Yeah. Very rapidly. Sometimes it feels yeah. like. Oh, I, I love to have a studio visit video <laughs> <laughs> about my next project. That's really great ideas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, so did you have any questions before we move into the next part, or just anything that you wanted to mention? Or when uh, you know, I was um, the memory is so important for me regarding my work, and um, uh, in my medium photo festival talk, uh, one of the audience after talk mentioned something that was interesting for me: how memories and Alzheimer might be and photography can have a relationship hmm. and um uh you know recently a person who is really important and dear for me diagnosed with alzheimer and uh, actually that's my mom hmm. and uh it it brings i don't know more attention to memories and how real it is or is it real you know hmm. to that for me I just want to say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting because memories are something that we, you know, talk about whether or not we trust a photograph, but you know, I've some of the reading that I've done about how memory works is that mm -hmm. we're not actually recalling something, but rather every time we remember something, our brain is actually creating the memory new each exactly. time. And so this whole idea of, I mean, I don't know what it's like for you, but for me, memory is so important and it's, it's so much a part of how I think of myself and how I interact mm -hmm. with the world. And yet yeah. the way that it is constructed new each time I remember it. And so each memory and even the remembering of remembering in the past mm -hmm. may not be quote unquote real. It's the kind of thing that actually freaks me out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, actually memories can be you know, there's two sides. There can be absolutely a history or there can be a manipulation. You never know. That they are so tricky. Yeah. And the idea of of not having this sort of reference point to work with, the idea of not having those memories or things like that is something that's very unsettling to me. Um, you know, mm -hmm. my, my grandmother, for example, my mother's mother mm -hmm. is uh, has a you know, pretty serious dementia at this point. She doesn't know who I am and she doesn't know who mm -hmm. her daughters are most of the time. Yeah. And it's interesting, I guess, if I'm able to separate myself emotionally from it, but it also just seems very tragic, you know? Yeah. But I was thinking, if it happened for me, how do I make work? Yeah, it's hard to, to think about that, right? Yeah, but it can be interesting, you know? <laughs> it's totally <laughs> different. Thing. You know, since I already changed everything in photography for myself when I moved to US, I'm I'm ready for other changes too. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because, you know, I've sometimes talked to people because um, you know, I think of myself as being both a writer and a visual artist. Mm -hmm. And the two sort of art forms uh, they work very differently for me where writing is something that I have to really labor over and I have to think about really hard. Mm -hmm. Whereas photography is something that happens almost automatically for me. Yeah. And so there is something about uh, photography, both as I think the 
image creator and as the viewer that it allows one to be very in the moment, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. without reference to something in the past or future. But then so many of us seem to make work that is about the past or the future. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I totally understand. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, why don't we take a quick little break and then we'll come back and do the second segment. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. So for the second segment, I always invite the guests to bring a topic of their own, which could be whatever you'd like to talk about, whatever happens to be on your mind. So Mm -hmm. what would you like to talk about today? Yeah, definitely. Immigration is one of them that involves many, many soft, many, as I said before, man-made rules and how it affects our lives. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's interesting because it's something when you talk about it being man-made, the whole concept of there being borders or countries at all. Sometimes it's it seems like such a concrete thing, and it seems so inescapable, and yet yeah, and you think are... that's that's there forever. Yeah, you think it was from the first day of that this earth was was there. Yeah, it's fascinating because it is both not real at all, but also very real. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How is this something like? How do you find yourself thinking about that sort of thing? You know the first. I, I I can't say the first time that I think about that because you know I I grew up with uh, three sisters mm. that none of us live in Iran and uh, my parents were there actually the moment that we are talking my mom and one of the sisters are in the sky going to Canada mm. <laughs> and uh, so the limitation that seeing my siblings bring to me. So he always thinks about borders. For example, my nephew always, um, when they were kids, uh, they were young, so young, they was always a question, why you cannot come to see us? So we come to see you, why you, you cannot come, come to see us? So, you know, from the time that I was a child, it was always borders, mm-hmm. location. We are here, we can go there, we cannot go there, you know, it was all that. But um, the final one that was really bring this to much more attention for me, you know, it was um, six years ago that I went back to Iran and um, to, you know, visit my family and gathering more more old family photos from the city that I was, I was grow up in. And um, I was supposed to receive my student visa in two days, but it takes nine months. Mm. Uh, and then Muslim ban happened. Then two times my visa pronounced invalid. Then they said valid. But I didn't know the, the day uh, that I received my passport with visa on it, that I wanted to come uh, come back to U.S. It was in the middle of my MFA program. I even couldn't say goodbye to anybody because I didn't know if I can enter the country or not because of the Muslim ban. So... And all of that, I feel that's unnecessary for human beings. You know, I I, I totally understand all the violence that uh, or, you know, immoral stuff in this world. But um, in some way, I feel that we are not dealing with it in a right way, in a human way. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, Mexico borders, I, I follow news about that. Uh, Again, the violence, uh, the severe violence that you see there is not necessary in this way. Yeah. It's something that's very, like we were saying, it's something that's that like the idea of borders and countries are something that seems like just like a property of the earth, you know, a property of the universe. But I think maybe a lot of people don't really realize how, how the concept of a border is kind of inseparable from violence that that making a border is kind of a violent act in and of itself you know yes then there is you and me Mm -hmm. there is not us you and me yeah definitely borders is in the middle yeah there's so much um you know obviously so i i live in san diego i've lived Mm -hmm. here for 17 years and Mm -hmm. um it's this is a city that is um you know, very intimately familiar with borders. Um, Mm -hmm. But even before that, you know, I've, I've lived in California for my whole life. um, And it's Mm -hmm. something that we always 
heard about. I think uh, obviously since 2016, 2017, there's been a lot more attention paid to the border. Yeah. But a lot of times I, f- I get frustrated because I feel like this is something a lot of Americans feel like this is a new thing, that it's only been since mm-hmm. 2016 that this has been an issue. Yeah. But, you know, forgetting that, you know, even within my own lifetime, obviously during the Bush administration, there was mm-hmm. so much of this, of the same kind of rhetoric happening, but people now yeah. for some reason want to think of George Bush as being like this sort of, you, you know, compare. well, yeah, <laughs> but people want to think of him as this kindly old man, but you, yeah. know, you know, and it's just, it's very frustrating because these, these issues are things and this violence is something that has been happening for so long and it continues yeah. to happen. You know, everybody, I know a lot of people who are more democratic leaning or left leaning in the United States mm-hmm. thought, well, now that we have Donald Trump gone, you know, things are, things are better, yeah. but you know, mm-hmm. many of these same violences are continuing to happen under Joe Biden as well. Yeah. 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 And everywhere is like that, you know, you're on borders, you know, it, it seems uh, we kind of accept it. It's, it's the way. And it shouldn't be like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's very frustrating and it's very, um, it's upsetting. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it's all about the, I feel it's all about the resources. Yeah. Um, Which, you know. It is something, yeah, it's something that I, it seems like as we're continuing in so many ways with climate change and things like that, these Mm -hmm. issues are only going to get, continue to get more, you know, large and more pressing, you know, people are going to be migrating because of climate change. And I don't think we're necessarily prepared for what that's going to look like. No. Yeah. So how do you see, what do you think that, uh, how, how in uh, 15 years, how do you see the borders? I, I think that this is very difficult to predict. I think even people who are very intelligent and, and spend a lot of time studying these things, have a hard time predicting, you know, it's very yeah. chaotic. Yeah. I'm certainly not an expert on that kind of thing. <laughs> Maybe in that time you think, okay, you're, you live in earth. We live in moon. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, um, the thing that I find, you know, because I am, uh, sort of politically active, uh, less so than I used to be just because I'm very tired, but mm-hmm. I try to be politically engaged and, the problem is that even though there are movements that are based around trying to treat immigrants humanely and treat borders in a more humane way and mm-hmm. reducing the amount of violence that we all do to each other, yeah, some of these systems have been in place for so long and they're so big that it mm-hmm. it it becomes very difficult to even imagine what one person can do or even a group of people can do, you know, it's hard to imagine change. Yeah. I guess though, I wonder like for somebody like me who I've essentially lived in the same place for my entire life, Mm -hmm. there are ways that things like culture and, and, and life change are, I mean, we all go through life change, but, but it's different, I think. And I, I guess I wonder because moving to another country is a big that's a big change. <laughs> it right? is a really big change. I, I've got it after, you know, I thought that I know how it is because before me, my I see that my sister re- left the country and I was in touch with them. I felt I have a good uh, understanding of it, mm. but experiencing it is different thing. <laughs> yeah. To me, the idea of, I mean, there are ways that even just the idea of leaving Northern California to come to Mm -hmm. Southern California felt like impossible to me. And the idea of, you know, moving to another state, even let alone another country feels just enormous, you know? So I guess I wonder sometimes like whether this feeling of attachment that I have to a place or a culture maybe makes it harder for me to imagine other kinds of change. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I got you. <laughs> mm, I, I, I was, I was thinking. You know, um, right now I'm in the in a point that it's hard for me to, you know, change my location. Mm. 
but um, I wasn't like that. For example, right now I, I live in LA right now, but you know I remember the first four years ago when I wanted to come to LA, I just you know I was in a trip in New York. I came back to New Mexico and just uh, grabbed my car, put my stuff in it, and drive to LA without even having a job here or without having a place here. But I figure out I figure out everything in the first day that I arrived. I think with immigration, it comes with two matters. The curiosity to see see the rest of the world. And also, in the, the other side, it somehow feels that um, you're, you're cutting your roots. Mm. There is two parts to that for me. That's how mm. I see it. The idea of cutting one's roots seems, you know... I think that would be very daunting for many people mm -hmm. and yet people do. Yeah. And it's something where just like with, with sort of maybe some of the things that we were talking about with, um, you know, whether it's stitching or burning yeah. in with photographs can feel like a cutting off, right. can feel like yeah. an ending, but also, you know, I'm thinking about how cutting a plant you know, we're talking about cutting roots, right? But like mm -hmm. how cutting a plant can be the thing that helps it grow more. Being able to see that that cutting as both of those things mm -hmm. seems, I don't know, relevant. <laughs> Actually, you know, um, cutting, uh, I shouldn't say cutting the roots, um, maybe have a distance, find a distance with that, you know. Mm. find. I, I try, for example, me with my my own work try to still have my roots in my you know culture the place i was born you know mm -hmm. and but it put um immigrant people in a uh, in a hard situation you know uh, i was talking a while ago with a friend uh, um who is also persian uh, and photographer living here it seems uh, we were talking about um Right now, for some artists in Iran, we are not considered Iranian artists anymore because they feel that we are so detached from the society because we do not live there. Mm. And um, here, uh, I'm not American, so I'm still talking about something uh, related to Iran, something related to my family. It seems that we are in a third place. Mm not Iranian, not American, you know? Yeah. And um, it even happened for me when I was in Iran. I remember when I was gathering uh, some information about um, Iranian photographer. Even I myself, for example, it was a photographer, Mitra Tabrizian, who lived in uh, UK. I was thinking he is not living here most of his life, m most of her life. So should I consider it among Iranian photographer or not? You know, mm. all this happened and um, we always in search of our roots, yeah. but the success, who knows? It's such an interesting question because I think for, you know, the question of what, you know, where one fits in is so defined by the place where you're asking the question, mm -hmm. you know, there's something really interesting about, this question to me, being um, Japanese American, mm -hmm. there's a sort of shorthand that, you know, when I'm, I, I shouldn't say when I'm here because I've actually never been to Japan, but mm -hmm. here, uh, mm -hmm. there is a sort of shorthand where I can just, where I might say to people, I'm Japanese. Yeah. And that feels like a part of my identity. In Japan, though, they would use a different word. They wouldn't say that I'm Japanese. Right, like the Japanese mm -hmm. word for a Japanese person is uh, nihonjin, uh -huh. which is something that you call only a, a a person who is both ethnically Japanese and a Japanese citizen. Oh, right. Whereas yeah. people who are in the Japanese diaspora, like there are many Japanese that live in Canada, in, um, yeah. in the U.S. There's actually a lot that live in Brazil and uh, mm -hmm. Argentina. Mm -hmm. Those people are in J Japanese are called Nikkei which it's a, mm. so there's a recognition that there is some connection, but it's, they're also considered separate over there. Yeah. But here yeah. I would be considered, you know, it's funny, right? Like for me, yeah. I was born here and grew up here. My parents were both born here and grew up here. My mm -hmm. grandparents were born here and grew up here, but you know, many people wouldn't necessarily consider me to be 
just American, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that yeah, third exactly. space is something that I'm very familiar with. Uh, yeah, definitely. The oral. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the last question that I always like to end with is, if there is a piece of art or literature or creativity in some form that you've experienced recently that meant something to you? There, there is a book that I love. It does eight volumes, actually. Hmm. That's um, In Search of Lost Time, Marcel Proust. Oh, okay, yeah. I, 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 can't, I, I haven't read all of it. The first two volumes, I think, the first volume, I think I listened to it at least four times. <laughs> mm. And every time there is something new in it for me. And that's um, that's really inspiring for me, that f- uh, work. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like a lot of photographers really love Proust. <laughs> it's something mm. that I've been meaning to read. I, I haven't read it myself. But mm. this connection that you feel to this, do you, can you say a little bit more about w- the connection you feel with it? You know, I, I don't know how to connect it with photography. I mostly connected connect uh, the concept with the way that I think, mm. with the way I see the reality. For example, at the beginning of the first volume of, volume of this book, the character talk about uh, how he going to sleep and how he is hearing other people having party, how he is waiting for his mom to come to him and to say good good night. All these things, you know, it, everything in that book is so visual for me. Mm. That's the kind of connection that I can make with that. And also the main character of this book, especially when he's a child, we have some kind of similarity. He mostly lives in his head and I'm kind of like that. <laughs> so <laughs> um, we make the connection. So, <laughs> yeah. And always that's like for, for me, when I, I, I feel I'm out of idea to make work, visual work, always reading fictional good novels, helping me to get the kind of attachment or a reach that I needed to my own path. Hmm. Yeah. I have been meaning to read that at least at the first one for mm-hmm. many years now, and I still haven't gotten to it, but maybe I'll, yeah. maybe I'll make more of an effort. I've been trying to catch up <laughs> on my reading lately. So uh, I know it's not easy to, to read or listen to uh, this book. Mm. For me, it's like that. I just start listening to that and I, I might listen to a, to a part several times in a row to get because partially is what the book is, and the other part is what it brings to my mind. Mm. And I make notes for myself, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking with me. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much. Okay, as I mentioned at the top of the episode, there is a link in the show notes to Fatime's Medium Festival lecture, which I think will make a great companion to this conversation. There's also a link to Fatime's website where you can see more of her work, including a short film that is part of the It's Hard to Kill series. Do check those out. And that is our show. Editing and mixing on this episode is by me, the music is by Poddington Bear, and transcription help is by Shea Aguinaldo. If you happen to be listening to this episode on the day it's released, it's my birthday tomorrow. And if you are feeling inclined to give me a gift, I would dearly love a review from you on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. There are links in the show notes for that. And you can find all of the show's social media information, email newsletter, transcripts, and show notes on our website at keepthechannelopen.com. Keep the Channel Open will be back with a new conversation on July 20th, so do be sure to come back for that. And until then, remember... Keep the channel open. Bye.